Okay, I think we will get started. It's so great to see so many of you interested in the founding of McPherson. Before we begin, we'll go back to 1872, when there were no cell phones. <laughs> um, please, everyone, um, if you haven't set your cell phone ringer to, uh, to silent, uh, please make sure you've You've done that uh, at this time. I'm Steve Reed, and I'm here with Jenny Hall tonight. And we're going to talk about the founding of McPherson, what really happened, about how McPherson was founded in those early events that determined whether the city would survive or not. And we begin, we begin with this image which is a split-site surveyor's compass, once owned by J.D. Chamberlain, who was the county surveyor in McPherson County. It's now in the collection of the Smoky Hill Museum in Salina. Chamberlain used this compass to survey the town sites of Lindsborg. No, actually, this is Salina. He used it to survey the town sites of Salina in 1858. Lindsborg in 1869, and McPherson in 1872. And this compass symbolizes the common bond between those three cities because we really can't talk about the founding of McPherson without also bringing in Salina and Lindsborg as well. I think the founding of the town is one of the most interesting parts of its history. And in the case of McPherson, this is veiled in some mystery. No written first-person accounts by any of the founders exist. We have the minutes of the McPherson Town Company here in the McPherson Room in the library. But the first 10 pages are missing, and they went missing sometime during the first 50 years. Did they simply fall out, or were they removed? And if so, why? And of course, the number of old photographs that exist from those very early years in the 1870s of McPherson, you know, I can count those on one hand. There just aren't many of those around. But we do know enough to have an interesting, if not entertaining, story. So let's begin. Let's turn the clock back to 1872, May of 1872 in Salina, Kansas. L.G. Skonka was chief clerk in the U.S. Land Office. He had access to the latest maps of the area. One day he took a closer look at the map for McPherson County, and he noticed that there was land available in the center of the county that would make for a good town site. So here's what Skonka saw when he looked at his maps of McPherson County. Now, if you will indulge me a little bit, I would like you all to close your eyes and imagine McPherson County as 901 square miles of nothing but prairie. There are no towns, no roads, no bridges, no golf courses. It's the river, streams, creeks, and prairie grass. You can open your eyes now. Um, McPherson County is a blank slate. And now we're going to add in Lindsborg, which was founded in 1869 and is the county seat of McPherson County in 1872. And then there's King City down south there. King City was founded in 1871 by a group from Ohio. And in June of 1872, it had 25 houses, a hotel, blacksmith shop, stores. King City is actually located directly south of where Elyria is today. In fact, the north edge of the King City Platte abuts the south edge of the Elyria Town Platte. King City always had problems, though. They struggled with flooding and disease. and they, uh, It was a hard go for them. Also, we're going to add in seven post offices, 
you can see they're scattered across the county. Nine schools. Again, most of them are in the north. And of course, there are settlers scattered across the county. Most of them are in the north. The number of settlers decreases as you go south. And then there are several trails and roads in the southern part of the county as well. Skanka also saw big opportunities when he looked at his map. He knew real estate, and as we know, the three most important things in real estate are what? Location. Yes, location, location, location. He knew what was going on. He knew that um, Lindsborg was really too far north to stay county seat. King City was, was too far to the south because the county seats typically for these counties were in the center. And there was nothing in the center of McPherson County. In 1871, the legislature approved a road that would link Salina and Wichita. And the state surveyors had it running right through the middle of McPherson County. And it was only a matter of time before the rail lines went through McPherson County to Wichita. So the area in the center of the county, which were known as the McPherson Flats, were primed for success. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about L.G. Skonka, Lawrence George Skonka, because this story, well, it's, it's really his story. We don't know how he really pronounced his last name, but it likely was pronounced Skonka. <laughs> we, we actually do know, you know, and you all think this is funny because here in McPherson we pronounce that Skanky Street. But there was actually a newspaper article at the time making fun of people who pronounced it skanky because they had phonetically sounded that sound out. So however he pronounced it, ironically, he didn't pronounce it the way that we pronounce it. He was born in Norway and he immigrated to the US. So yes, the founder of McPherson was a Norwegian. He'd lived in Salina six years by 1872. He was a young man. He was only about 20, 24 years old in 1872. And let me tell you, he was a rock star. He married the daughter of a local judge in Salina. He was a member of the IOOF, a member of the Knights of Pythias. He was active in the Salina Dramatic Society, the Salina Rifles, and he was also active in local politics. The Salina newspapers just loved him. They were always reporting on his activities around town. Items like how many prairie chickens he shot and what carriage he was driving currently. <laughs> he was the talk of the town. But alas, we have no photograph of him. Um, one of the disappointments of history. Skonka also had a Lindsborg connection. In addition to being chief clerk at the land office in Salina, he was co-owner with Nils Peter Nelson of a general store in Lindsborg. And for those of you who are, into, who are into the details, one source placed the location of his store at the southwest corner of Maine and Lincoln. One ad in uh, the Saline County Journal indicated, our goods were bought in the Eastern market with a special reference to the wants of this people, which means that you could buy lutefisk at Skonka's place. So let's, let's return to the U.S. Land Office in Salina. It's May 1872. Skonka wants to plat a town on the treeless McPherson Flats. And Charlie Wickersham, at least we believe this was his name, an old Saline County settler walks in the door of the land office and tells Skonka that he heard a group of Kentuckians were wanting to start a town on the McPherson Flats also. What was he going to do about it? So Skanka wants to get down there and get the job done. And these mysterious Kentuckians resurface later in our story, by the way. So he asks some of his friends if they went in on the enterprise. There's Oscar Seitz, 
Seitz was 34 years old. He was a druggist, and he also owned a hardware store. James Marlin, he was only 27. He was a grocer. Robert Bishop, he was the old man of the group at 44. Bishop was in real estate. These last names sound familiar to you? <laughs> yep, the library is on Marlin Street, and I'm sure you recognize all the rest of the street names in McPherson. But as you can see by this group, McPherson wasn't really founded by any particular ethnic group, nor was it founded for religious reasons. This was business. This was adventure. Salina had worked out so well that they wanted to do it again. So anyway, his friends tell them, yes, they're in. And Skanka wastes no time. He knows exactly where he wants to plant the town. He marks the location on his map. They're ready to go. This is most likely what happened, based on the historical evidence. It's sometime in late May. And they leave Salina at daybreak in an old stagecoach, driven by a man named Hubner. They've packed crackers and cheese and other supplies, including what was described as drinkables. <laughs> and they're also well armed with ammunition. Thanks to the Swedish settlers in northern McPherson County, that area was a fairly civilized place. But the southern part of the county, well, that was a different story. With all those roads, remember all those roads and trails in the southern part? It was like living close to the interstate. One early resident of King City remembered that most men wore revolvers and holsters as a matter of daily life because they never knew when they might need them. There is a road between Salina and McPherson, Salina and Lindsborg, but it wasn't what you and I would recognize as befitting the name road. So anyway, they're all in the stagecoach. By mid-morning, they are at Lindsborg, where they stop to rest the horses and eat some breakfast. So there's Lindsborg. They are at Lindsborg. It's mid-morning. Then they travel about one and a half miles east and ford the Smoky Hill River. And after they cross the river, they're in a new land. One of the most fascinating aspects of the founding of McPherson is how they found McPherson. How do you find the exact location of an X on the map in the middle of nowhere? McPherson County was a young county. There were no roads that would help them. The only thing in McPherson County that might qualify was a as a road was there was a postal trail which ran from Lindsborg to New Gotland. But that, that wasn't going to help them. They had three points of reference. When the county was surveyed in 1865, the surveyors would pile piles of stones at the intersection of the section lines. So wherever there were piles of stone, you could, t you could tell that was the intersection of a section line. Also, Skonka's map showed parcels of land on his map. He showed parcels of land and farmers would sometimes take a large plow and run it along the perimeter of their land, turning over the earth to mark the property line and also serve as a path. And then also there were the various streams and creeks on the map, so they could use those as a guide too. So these guys are relying on a compass, landmarks, plowed paths, and piles of stone to navigate their way on Skonka's map. And the landmarks thinned out considerably as they went south. Okay, so they're across the Smoky Hill River. Is everyone with me? We're across the Smoky Hill River. Then they, um, they travel over to Point Creek where they pick up their friends, Josiah Fisher and Thomas Simpson. Again, more street names there.
and then they head southeast over the hills. They have to hit this section line, which is, we know it as Highway 81. And they do, at about where Pueblo Road is now. So they're head due south from there. Now at some point, when they started running out of points of reference, they very likely tied a handkerchief to the front wheel of the, their wagon, counting the revolutions, converting those to miles, and following their progress on Skonka's map, trying to navigate with the compass. And then they get lost. <laughs> they're so close. They're actually around the intersection of First and Main Street, but they get lost. Skonka has his map, and he knows that there's a farm about a mile, the closest farm is about a mile to the east. It's the A.J. Gustafson farm. And so they know where the farm is, they can see it, so they head east to Gustafson farm. Gustafson helps them find the cornerstone on his land. He helps them get situated, and Gustafson remembered them tying a handkerchief to their wagon wheel on his farm. So we know that at that point, they were doing it for sure. So they're back on track. They head, they find that section line at Main and First and they head south and they're there. We know it as the intersection of Main and Kansas. Skonka gets out of stagecoats and digs a hole where the section lines cross at Kansas and Main. So McPherson has been founded. So it's evening. It's been a long, hard day. But the work is done. Dinner's finished. They are resting and taking it all in, probably opening up the drinkables, <laughs> when they see a solitary rider approaching from the southeast. Jenny and I gave a very abbreviated version of this program to a elementary school class and we asked the class what we said what do you think would happen what do you think happened then and the little boy raised his hand he said they shot him <laughs> well I, th I think he had probably been playing too many video games or watching the evening news but you know I've always imagined this scene in my mind when they see the uh, the horsemen riding towards them, that maybe one of them did chamber a shell in his rifle. And maybe another one might have pulled his revolver out of the holster and checked the cartridges and laid it in his lap. Of course, the really brave person in this scene was the horseman, since there was one of him and six of them. But anyway, when the horseman arrived at the campsite, he identified himself as John Fellows, who was the postmaster at King City. And he asked them something along the lines of, what are you doing here? They told him they'd just founded a town. And fellows told them that things weren't going real well in King City, and he just might move up to the new town himself. We know there was discontent among the members of the King City Town Company. And in fact, ever in pursuit of the county seat, they were actually planning on laying out another town a little north of the present site of McPherson. And both parties started fretting about those Kentuckians who were supposed to be arriving on the scene, but never did. But anyway, when the McPherson Town Company charter was signed on May 28th, there were now 12 members instead of six because the King City Town Company merged with the McPherson Town Company and they named the new town McPherson Center. Part three, a suburb of Salina. So the first thing to do, first thing on the list, was to lay out the town into blocks and lots. So they called in J.D. Chamberlain. Remember Chamberlain's compass, the first slide we saw? Chamberlain came with his compass and other surveying equipment. This, this um, expense list lists some of the expenses 
Chamberlain received four dollars a day to survey the town site, which was pretty good money, really. And uh, Joseph Height was the assisting surveyor. There were a couple other employees that helped him. And then uh, there's a line here, it says, two Swedes assisting the surveyor. <laughs> I, it looks like the Swedes got, the two Swedes got a dollar and a half for 12 days. So you can do the math on that. The second thing they needed, they've surveyed the town site, water. You've got to have water. It's a critical part of any town. An 85-foot well was dug by hand and lined with brick. The location of this well was thought to be near the intersection of Maine and Kansas. However, there's no real evidence to support this. It's not evident in any photographs or any other documents. This is a photograph of the intersection of Maine and Marlin. And we see the well right here. So it very likely was at the intersection of Maine and Marlin. This well was used by city residents and farmers that would come for miles around and they'd carry water home in barrels for use by their families. So this well was really well used. It was a uh, it was, you could say it was McPherson's first economic development incentive. Okay, we've got the town platted, we've got water, buildings. This is the very first building in McPherson. Harrison Balker, in June, built the first building. This is his general store, and it was located at the southwest corner of Kansas and Maine. The Ameriprise office is currently in this location now. The building was actually moved, so this photograph was taken. Um, that's the county jail in back of it. So this building was actually on Euclid Street, and then it was torn down. I would say 1940s. Okay, so we've got the general store. You need a hotel. This hotel was moved in from King City, and it was renamed the McPherson House. And in fact, this is the earliest known photograph of McPherson. It was probably taken early in 1873. One reporter writing about the McPherson house said that it is where good hash is thrown into hungry stomachs in first class style. Now this is, this is one of my favorite photographs of McPherson, just because it's one of those photographs where there's so much going on here. So here's everyone, they're standing out on the porch. And you gotta remember these old photographs People just didn't whip their phone out and go click and take the photo. You had to, you had to hold your position for several seconds, you know, half a minute. And you can see right here, there's a little baby. The woman's holding the baby, but the baby's head is a blur because the baby isn't having any of that standing still for 30 seconds. So, uh, and then over to the left, there was, a, you could tell there were some horses that weren't doing a very good job of standing still either. The town company invested all the funds they received from the sale of shares in improvements for the town. By the end of that first summer, by the end of the summer of 1872, one observer wrote, a number of acres have been plowed upon the town site which are to be planted in trees. The streets are laid out in a systematic order and parks and public buildings come in for a good share of the attention of the city fathers. Given the home city of the original founders, as well as the number of Salina businessmen who are now had enterprises in McPherson, the editor of the Saline County Journal noted that McPherson is a suburb of Salina. <laughs> and now a few final comments about L.G. Skonka. Ironically, he never lived in the city he founded. He and his family moved to Lindsborg in the mid-1870s, where he devoted himself full-time to the mercantile business. And of course, they loved him there too. 
They thought he was such a great guy. They even elected him mayor in 1881. A Norwegian, the mayor of Lindsborg. <laughs> and of course, Skanka also had stores in Marquette and McPherson. He moved to Chicago in 1883 to get into the lumber business, and he died in Denver in 1905. Jenny? We consider McPherson and Lindsberg to be friendly neighbors, but that clearly wasn't the case in 1873, the very year after McPherson was founded. 1873 was the year that McPherson and Lindsberg battled to win the county seat. It was a struggle that involved whiskey, shotguns, and accusations of fraud and bribery. McPherson County was fortunate to avoid bloodshed. Many Kansas counties were not so lucky. Robert de Arment in his book, Ballots and Bullets, says the Sunflower State had 29 bitterly contested county seat battles in all sections of the state. The most intense and bloody were in the western part of Kansas between 1885 and 1892. Dozens of men were killed in these county seat battles. Many were wounded by non-fatal gunshots and shots, and the National Guard was called out six times to restore peace. Although bitter feelings existed for years over the McPherson County seat contest, only heated words, not hot bullets, were exchanged. The first county seat for McPherson was located at Swedal, three miles southwest of the present Lindsberg. This was in March of 1870. This remained the location of operations in this structure on the left, owned by a major Holmberg. As Justice of the Peace, he presided over 600 inhabitants in the county. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go back a, minute. a McPherson Republican newspaper article says the building known as Holmberg's Castle is described as, followed, as follows. In the cellar, he had liquor. In the office, justice was administered. And from the tower, Holmberg watched his working men and kept a lookout for Indians. On the right is the structure used at Sweetall as a temporary county seat. It was short-lived. Just three months later, Lindsberg itself was named as the county seat. In Lindsberg, the first meetings were held in county commissioners' homes. But in July of 1870, meetings were moved to the second floor of a general merchandise store owned by George Shields. They rented it for $4 a month. Soon after this, a building was constructed known as the Arkin Building. We believe it's the building in this drawing. This became home to the county seat for the next three years, but trouble was brewing. During those three years, there was an influx of settlers to the south part of McPherson County, most notably to the place known as King City, which we've already heard about near the current day Elyria. McPherson County now had two population centers, Lindsburg in the north, in King City in the south part of the county. But when the southern tier of townships was struck off the bottom of McPherson County to create Harvey and Reno counties, King City seemed too far north to be a practical county seat. Some of the prominent settlers from King City and businessmen there picked up and moved to the newly established McPherson Center. The new town of McPherson with its central location became the focus of growing interest for a county seat location. Getting or maintaining a county seat was a big issue. Lots of money could be made by town founders on very little investment. The winner would become a strong candidate to attract the railroad and other businesses to town. As early as 1872, McPherson started talking about making a bid for the county seat. By February of 1873, McPherson had completed the construction of a town company building. And in May of that year, citizens submitted a petition with 483 signatures asking that the county seat be relocated to McPherson. Commissioners granted the petition. It was placed on the ballot for a June election. Four places would actually be vying for county seat on that ballot. Lindsburg, New Gotland, McPherson, and King City. 
Busy months of lobbying followed with great promotion and publicity highlighting the merits of each site. This is a poster of McPherson's efforts to attract voters. McPherson offered the second story of the town company building free for 10 years and two shares in the town site to erect a more permanent courthouse. Other inducements recorded in the town company minutes were of a more dubious nature. The town company directors at a meeting in May agreed to give 10 town company shares to each party willing to vote and influence votes for McPherson <laughs> in the election. <laughs> Lindsberg, of course, wanted to retain the county seat and Major Holmberg was a strong promoter. But others were beginning to realize that they were pretty far north in the county to be a strong contender. So they rallied behind New Gotland. New Gotland boasted a few amenities, an underground water supply, and they also offered a free location for the courthouse and jail. It was a compromise solution for North County residents who were increasingly realizing, who were increasingly realizing that it would not be practical to have the county seat so far north. King City was always a long shot. It was already starting to die away as a town, and with the removal of prominent families to McPherson, there wasn't going to be much left. Voting day arrived. Plenty of voters and plenty of action. A story that's recounted in several sources says that Major Holmberg drove down from Lindsberg to McPherson on the big day, but the McPherson folks were ready for him. They were waiting. They expected him to be armed and to cause trouble. Some accounts say that one man hid under the courthouse steps to see if they could find a gun on his person. Other stories indicate that a gun was spied under his coat when he sat down to eat. Either way, as recorded by historian Jesse Hill Rowland, quote, joy unspeakable reigned when the gleaming weapon was discovered attached to the major's belt. The major was charged with carrying a concealed weapon and disturbing the peace. No formal case was ever brought against him, but he was detained long enough to keep him away from the McPherson polling site and prevented him from getting back to Lindsberg to cast his own vote. <laughs> the day ended without bloodshed, but with plenty of accusations and acrimony. Well, about when the ballots were counted, Lindsberg had one vote, and we know it wasn't Major Holmberg's. New Gotland had 325. King City took just three of the votes. McPherson was declared the winner with 605. These lopsided results raised some questions. Did fraud occur? Had votes been bought? These numbers for McPherson votes were significantly higher than the elections prior to and shortly after the county seat battle. Was it just because of the int intense interest in the issue, or were there other more suspicious reasons? There were accusations printed in the McPherson Independent newspaper that McPherson residents employed farmhands and other laborers just long enough to have them register to vote in McPherson. There were also insinuations of intimidation at the polls before election day. It's difficult to know for sure. What's considered unethical today simply passed for town booster activities back in the 1800s. And accusations, as you know, are not proof. What we do know is 12 shares were paid out by the town company. This low number of shares indicates that no large-scale bribery occurred and no large payouts were made to any individuals. It may be that the McPherson Town Company directors were worried about the appearance of fraud or of drawing attention um, that would warrant an investigation prompting a new election, which had happened in several other Kansas counties. If there were any hopes of a big payday for McPherson town boosters, they mostly went unfulfilled. Records do show that one McPherson businessman, William West, pictured here, received a direct payment from the town company for the princely sum of $10. It was a payment for whiskey that he bought and distributed on election day. <laughs> Whether whiskey or guns affected the outcome or not, McPherson became the county seat, located in the McPherson Town Company building on Main Street. According to a town legend passed down by historian Jesse Rowland, 
the folks at Lindsberg, pictured here, were a bit reluctant to give up the county records in the aftermath of the election. When the McPherson contingent went up to collect the documents, they found it necessary to distract the Lindsberg officials long enough to get into the building and retrieve the records. It was only after the McPherson group's departure that the books were found missing. Nothing but word of mouth accounts of this exist, but it's not surprising that a story highlighting the discord between the towns was perpetuated in the climate of strong feelings over the county seat battle. And so McPherson became the county seat. McPherson's Main Street location, as shown here in the printing office, remained the home for the county seat until a fire in 1883 burned this entire block. Fortunately, a fireproof safe had been installed and the documents were undamaged. This fire afforded Lindsberg a last chance to try to win back the county seat. Lindsberg made an offer. They would build a jail and a courthouse worth at least $25,000 and make it a gift to the county. But the failure of this offer to even reach a petition or ballot stage ended all hopes for Lindsberg. McPherson remained the county seat, moving several times to different locations downtown until the current courthouse was built in 1894. We apologize for the short drive to come to McPherson to take care of business at the courthouse. For those of you living in Lindsberg, New Gotland, Illyria, and elsewhere. But the good news is, the library's right across the street. Drop by and visit us, where we'll do our best to prove that no lingering animosity or rivalry exists.